Hello, everybody. Welcome back to She Thrives Plant Based, Strong and Free, this amazing summit that is, um, you know, changing the way we think about food. It's definitely for anyone, any woman out there who wants to up level her health, uh, step into a, a healthier way to live, a happier way to be. I am the founder and host of this event. My name is Margot Freitag. I am super excited to introduce you to today's guest. We have Chef AJ with us. Chef AJ has been devoted to a plant-based diet for almost 40 years. She's the host of the TV series Healthy Living with Chef AJ. She's got a background in comedy. She's been on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. She's been on David Letterman and more. She's a chef, a culinary instructor, professional speaker, an author. She tells uh, people how to create meals and transform their health. And she's the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. I could really go on and on. This woman is amazing. But without further ado, welcome, Chef AJ. Thank you, Marco. It's a pleasure to be here. So great to have you here. So um, let's get right into this. I would love it if you could share how this all started for you. And um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for asking. So I was born in 1960 in Chicago to a morbidly obese mother, which set the stage for me to become overweight or obese, as you probably know. I mean, genetics is a strong component. It loads the gun, but it's really your diet and lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And I developed uh, obesity at a very young age. From the age of five, I was first what you would consider fat or overweight, but by 11, I weighed 160 pounds and I was not yet even five feet tall. So that's obese. And that was 1970 where it wasn't fashionable to be overweight. Not that it's fashionable now, but it's more accepted now. It's more common. Now something like one out of every three children under the age of 18 is overweight or obese. But in 1960, there was only one fat kid in every class and that kid was me. I became vegan very young. Actually, it's been almost 42 years now since I've been vegan. I became vegan at the age of 17, my freshman year of college for ethical reasons, which was great for some aspects of my health, like I never developed heart disease or diabetes, things like that. But I was what you call a junk food vegan. I was not eating the foods that I eat and recommend today, like Dr. Neil Barnard would recommend on his PCRM power plate, the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. I was eating from my own four food groups, candies, cakes, cookies, cookies and pies. It was vegan. Dr. Pepper, which was my lunch every day, was vegan. Coke Slurpees, my breakfast every day was vegan. But I was not healthy. And at the age of 43, after being vegan for 26 years, I woke up one morning bleeding profusely. And it turned out I had what they call precancerous polyps lining my colon. And my colon was in such a state of disarray and Ill, Ill health that they could not remove them during a normal procedure where they use the, the calipers to take the polyps out. And they said I would have to come back and have actual surgery surgery. And I, my biggest fear in life is general anesthesia because when I was a teenager, I went into the hospital to get, I think it was a cyst to remove from my head. Like it was gonna be a same day procedure, but they needed to use anesthesia. And I was allergic to the anesthetic and I woke up being resuscitated by a team of respiratory therapists and ended up in the hospital for months. And I've never gotten over that fear of anesthesia. So I was willing to do anything to avoid surgery, even eat right. So. My husband would joke that I'm the only vegetarian that didn't eat fruits and vegetables. And that was true until the age of 43. I thought Skittles were a fruit. And I went to the Optimum Health Institute on July 6, 2003, which was the first time that I even heard that what we eat has any influence on any aspect of our life. Not only how we look, how we feel, but actually what diseases we can acquire and what diseases we can reverse. And it's a three-week program. I actually only ended up doing two weeks of it. But I learned enough to realize that diet is, is profound, that the, the answer to our healing, to our health, to our weight problems is at the end of our knife and fork. And people would come back every Friday and give testimonials how they heal themselves through a whole plant food diet from diseases that many people think of as incurable, like lupus and Lyme's disease and brain cancer and AIDS. And these people were like way sicker than me. I mean, I, I had pre-cancer and I adopted the diet. So instead of eating my junk food vegan diet, I started eating a whole food plant-based diet free of sugar, oil, flour, salt, and alcohol, and eating lots of fruits and vegetables. 
And within six months, I went back to my gastroenterologist and I had a re repeat sigmoidoscopy. And he accused me of having had surgery at some other hospital because he said all the polyps, which he had photographs of and their exact size and location were gone. He said my colon was clear, clean, pink, and vascular like a newborn baby. And he said, where did you have the surgery? I said, well, I didn't, I'm afraid of surgery. And he, and he said, well, then where, where do you, how do you explain that these polyps are gone? I said, well, you know, I, I changed my diet. He goes, well, that's impossible. And there was a, an assisting GI doctor in the room. I think she was from India by her accent. And when he left the room, she goes, I believe you. And right then, like Oprah talks about the light bulb going off. I'm like, wow, this, this is something. And that's when I, I really just, my life stopped. I was working as an activity director at a retirement home. I took a leave of absence from my job. I attended culinary school, not because I ever thought I was going to be a professional chef, which I was for years in a restaurant or a cookbook author or a speaker, but because I knew that if I was going to eat this way, by this way, I mean a healthy version of a plant-based diet instead of the junk food version, that it was going to have to take, taste a lot better than it did at OHI, which was sprouts and seed cheese and kind of like weird brown juices. And so in a nutshell, that's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. So you became a chef mm -hmm. and then you worked as a chef. So I, um, I do, yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that and how and how that played obviously a big role in-, in Yeah, well, it was, I mean, it was fun. I really wanted to have some restaurant experience because I didn't feel like I would earn the title Chef AJ if I didn't actually work as a chef, you know, just going to culinary school. You know, I, I mean, I just felt like I wanted to have that experience. And so for about five years, I worked as the executive pastry chef at a restaurant in Los Angeles called Sante, which is no longer there. It wasn't a vegan restaurant, and that's what was so cool about it, is that I had the opportunity to expose people that weren't even vegan to really delicious desserts that were basically free of sugar. I mean, refined sugar. I used fruit. I used the whole fruit and nothing but the whole fruit. I used dates to sweeten, date syrup, date paste, and, and whole dates. And most of them were actually free of flour, and most of them were free of gluten. A lot of them were raw desserts. I mean, they were rich. They were high in fat and high in calories, but they were vegan, and nobody even cared or knew because, I mean, they cared. It, but it, nobody knew because on my it's it's like an audition when you I don't know how it is in other places but at least for my job as a pastry chef that, that was the other great advantage of being called AJ is they thought I was a guy when I got there because I still think there's some discrimination that, that all the guys get the better jobs or the opportunities but when I sent the res resume chef AJ and they got there you're a girl and I'm like yeah I'm a girl but they gave me the test you know the practice where I made all the different things and I got hired based on, on the quality and the taste and the look of my desserts and I made some amazing things that, that, that I have. I actually have a third cookbook that I don't promote a lot. It's an ebook now going to hard copy because, because I'm known more now for food addiction and weight loss that I feel like I don't want to be promoting this book to the masses because it, it is so high fat, high calorie, but it's still better than having sugar and flour and all kinds of these non-food desserts. But I make things like, and I still have celebrities contacting me. Like I don't live in LA anymore, so I can't really make them for them. But, you know, like I was really famous for my German chocolate cake that was developed as a request from Dr. Hans Deal, my frozen peanut butter chocolate cheesecake. So, you know, what I love about it is that these desserts are for everyone. So not everybody is overweight or suffering from food addictions, but these can be enjoyed by people that just are looking for amazing vegan desserts or people that aren't vegan, maybe that just are looking for cholesterol free desserts or just people that are looking for desserts that are maybe kosher or gluten free. So it, they have a wide appeal in that aspect, but make no mistake, they are not calorie free. These are treats, but it was, it was really a pleasure to, uh, to, to do this. Beautiful. So as a chef, how do you t uh, teach people to, you know, obviously you can do these elaborate, amazing things in the kitchen. For most of us who are just, you know, trying to eat a healthy plant-based diet, um, you know, we struggle. A lot of people struggle to, to keep it simple enough to make it sustainable. So what's your advice around that? Right. Well, you know, I had, I had a friend that was a handyman for a property management company and his wife, he could never get him to do anything, you know? So, you know, the old saying, the cobbler's, uh, the cobbler's children have no shoes. Just because I know how to do fancy stuff, I never do it. I almost never do it. I mean, once in a while. The, the truth is, is I eat and I teach people to eat very, very simply, especially if they struggle with food addictions or want to lose weight. When you eat simply, first of all, it's easier. It takes less time for your food prep. 
and it's actually cheaper and you can get into like what I call the deep groove of healthy eating. So what I, even though I've written three cookbooks and have probably over 300 recipes, I teach people to eat food, not recipes. You know, a lot of people say, oh, plant-based diet, it's boring, it's restrictive, when there could be nothing further from the truth because if you look at the category of legumes, beans, split peas, lentils, there's over 18,000 different kinds. There's 400 types of sweet potatoes alone. But most people don't eat 30 different distinct breakfasts per month and 30 different lunches and 30 different dinners, whether they're vegan or not, or whether they're healthy or not. Most people have, when I've looked at the research, it was something like six to 10 family favorites, like meals that they repeat over and over. So especially if you're new and transitioning, find those meals that you like that you can repeat over and over and switch out the components. So I love the what, what monks do, the one bowl method, or people call them Buddha bowls or, or all kinds of things, where you take these various delicious components that you like, that you've preferably batch cooked in advance, so it makes it really easy. And then people, family members, even company loves this, can construct their own meals. And there's restaurants now, at least there was when I lived in LA, in the malls, where you th this idea was there. They were either called poke bowls or like Chipotle would do it. So basically, a grain, a bean, a green. You're meaning you have some greens, you have some starch, you have some sauce. So you start with whatever you want your starch to be. Any grain, brown rice, quinoa, millet, you know, anything that's going to be a healthy, whole, hearty, whole grain. And it might be more than one starch. You might also add some beans, many different kinds of beans. You might want to add some chunks of sweet potatoes or butternut squash, you know, to make it even more hearty. Of course, you don't want to forget your, your non-starchy vegetables. You can add things like carrots and cabbage and corn. And well, corn is actually a grain, but th that is great in a bowl. And you can add, of course, you want to get some leafy greens, either on a bed of raw or a bed of, bed of cooked and then some delicious sauce. So preferably oil-free, whole food plant-based. There's recipes in my book all over. Salsa. Salsa is a great topping. You can make guacamole if you can afford the higher fat. You can make guacamole out of peas. You can make my yummy sauce. You can make hummus or thin it down a little. But the varieties are endless and you really never get bored because you're switching up the components every day. And this can be for every meal, by the way. And people love it because they can, you know, they can do what they want. And I'm telling you, at least in LA, there are whole restaurants now like Harvest Bar that are based on this this concept, I can't think of the other names, but, but they, in, and people love it because, you know, one, they take what they want, they eat what they want. You do need to have a little bit of batch cooking, not skill, but you have to do it. In other words, like the food doesn't magically manifest healthy food. So you've got to be willing maybe to take a few hours every week and either do it yourself or hire somebody to do it. It's not that hard to stick in a couple of trays of potatoes and sweet potatoes in the oven. You can eat some, you can refrigerate some, you can freeze some, you can do the same thing with grains and beans. I think one of the most important tools that help people get food on the table quickly is the Instant Pot electric pressure cooker. I prefer the eight quart because you can make large quantities. It's very easy to throw stuff in and push a button in less than 30 minutes. You've got a hearty soup, stew, chili. So these are things that you can do. You know, unless you're just eating every meal in the drive through at McDonald's now, eating plant-based is not any harder than eating not plant-based because you're, you're doing something to get the food on the table now. You're just doing it a little bit differently. Right on, Those, great advice. Super good tip. I love it. Um, okay, so here's the deal, is that for a lot of women, and we're obviously speaking to women today, so that's why I say women, um, a lot of women really, they know that they need to eat healthy plant-based meals, and yet they can't make it stick. And maybe there's a preoccupation with food, maybe there's a, a poor relationship with food or their own body or themselves. Um, we've got emotional eating and self-sabotage of all kinds. So we know we've got to get the food right, but there's this whole other piece. So, and I know that you have personal experience with this and professional. So would you just share a little bit of, of what? Well, you, you know, right? there's a difference between knowing and doing. And I think most people, Margo, know that they need to eat a little bit healthier and feed their families healthier. And the, the, it's the implementation is the hard part. And so you know what, one of the things I tell people is why do you want to do this? You know, why do you really want to do this? Because, you know, sometimes people really don't. They think they should because somebody told them, but they really don't. And if you don't want to do it, there's nothing I can say to make you do it. You know, eating healthy is not a court order thing. I mean, maybe it should be for, for some families, but it's not. So you need, first of all, you need to really be honest with yourself. Do you really want to do this? You know, I, I just got back from the holistic holiday at sea 
the vegan cruise where I was a speaker and I do a lot of private consultations. And the first question I ask people because they're coming to me for weight loss is why do you want to lose weight? And, and, and you can, if you don't need to lose weight, you can substitute why do you want to get healthy? Why do you want to eat healthy? But if you don't have a compelling reason, it's probably not going to stick. You know, a lot of people want to lose weight for an event like their, their child's wedding, their high school reunion, and that can be done. But if that's the only reason, the minute that event is over, they're probably not going to maintain that weight loss. And so there's a wonderful person that you might want to interview one day that I love named Dr. Rosanna Alviera. She's a geneticist at the UC Davis School of Integrative Medicine, where she teaches lifestyle medicine to medical students. And she talks about the why that makes you cry. So if you have that, that's a good starting point. Because if you, you know, just because your doctor said, you know, you're, you, you got to lower your cholesterol, you got to lose some weight. That's not enough of a reason to motivate people to, to do something. So you, you, you know, for me, the why that made me cry was that, uh, at least for the weight loss, was that I was, even after changing my diet to a healthier diet, I still could not lose the weight. And when I was 50 years old, almost 10 years ago now, I slipped on a wet floor in an office building where they didn't put the little thing, and I severely broke my knee. And when I went to the emergency room, they gave me crutches. And because I was so heavy, I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now, I, I just couldn't do it. And I couldn't use the walker. And then I was in a wheelchair. And, you know, I was 49 years old. I'm in a wheelchair for like four months. But the worst part is, is I couldn't even use, I couldn't do my I couldn't take care of my needs. You know, I had to have help from my husband. It was, it was humiliating to be less than 50 years old and not being able to use the restroom. And I was, I was ashamed. I was humiliated. And I said, you know, when I'm out of this wheelchair, I am going to once and for all lose this weight. And that was, the, but also the why that made me cry is they told me I had to have knee surgery. And as you know, from my previous story, I was like, no way, because they wouldn't do it without general. And I, you know, they tell me, oh, the anesthesia is safer today. Well, I'm still asthmatic and I still don't, I don't, you know, when you wake up with a team of respiratory therapists with a tube and you're about to be intubated, thank God I wasn't. It's like, there's no way. So for my, me, the why that made me cry was that I, I, I will do anything, even eat well to avoid surgery. And so if you know why you want to do it, and if it's not for something like just a one day looking good in a photo, I think that's going to help you to find, to find the reason. And, and, and anybody with children, I think that's a why. I mean, if you have children or grandchildren, right there, for most people, that's a why. Yeah, no kidding. So what did it take for you? I mean, you had your why that made you cry. You had everything you needed inside of you to do it. What did you do? I mean, you knew how to eat. What did you yeah. change? What did you change? You know, um, there's an old saying that when the student's ready, the teacher appears. And everything I teach now was already written by wonderful people in the plant-based movement. So I really want to just give a shout out to Dr. John McDougall because nothing that I did, he didn't say for 40 years. And I actually had his book, The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss, on my bookshelf. I hadn't read it. I read it now, but I didn't read it. So, so it's not that I even did anything extraordinary. It's just that the timing was right for me to meet these two gentlemen, Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Doug Lyle, the co-authors of The Pleasure Trap. In January of 2011, when I went to the True North Health Center, I wasn't going for weight loss, even though I weighed 50 pounds more. I was actually going because I was on psychiatric medicine that was given to me when my baby died, and I wanted to get off it, and I couldn't get off it. I tried with many different approaches and doctors for years, and I, I just didn't want to be on these drugs. And so the idea was that I was going to go to the True North Health Center and fast, and I was going to get off this medication. Well, as it turned out, you can't get, you can't fast when you're on psychiatric drugs. So I didn't get off them at that moment, but I met Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer and I attended their lectures and they basically just, I learned from them everything that was in the McDougall program for maximum weight loss, but maybe I was just ready then. And maybe because I, I'm a little bit dyslexic. And so reading is not easy for me, but when I went to the lectures and it was explained to me that way, and I had private sessions with Dr. Lyle, it was like, I was like, Oh wow, I get it now. Even when I heard it, it still took me a year to implement it. And that's why I don't worry if people watch your summit and they don't do it right away. I mean, if, they're, if, they, if they have a disease, then I would hope they would go further faster. But you're planting seeds. So I heard this stuff and I'm like, eh, I don't know. It's kind of, you know, what, you know, calorie density, you know, don't eat all these high fat nuts and stuff. But it took me about a year and then I did it. And then it, it's like, it's like 
the, the once you know the, what's that saying you take one step towards the universe and they take 10 towards you once I actually did it and implemented first I had to understand it there was a period where I just didn't understand it but once I understood it, it still took some it took some time to marinate in my brain and once I did it I mean I've never looked back I, I implemented what I call my ultimate weight loss program which is, is basically the dietary style taught at True North and at the McDougal Maximum Weight Loss book. And it, it was January 2nd, 2012. And, you know, I, I haven't looked back. And it's and I want to say that it's been actually really easy for the first time in my life after so many failed attempts at weight loss to not only lose the 50 pounds, but to keep it off eating an abundance of delicious food. And it, it's it's wonderful. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? So you've never felt hungry. You got over the pleasure trap, all of that, and and here you are. Yeah. And do you ever have um, uh, what happens? Do you ever have cravings? <laughs> do you have uh, difficult moments? Um, and how do you handle them? Yeah. Well, I. I I don't think I have cravings the same way that the people that are just starting out have cravings. You know what I'm saying? Because I find that cravings, uh, th there, is some phys there is a physiological aspect to some cravings when people are first transitioning because there's some detox and withdrawal. But I think cravings are, cravings are largely emotional, you know, for certain foods, for comfort foods, things like that. Now, I just, like I said, I just got back from the cruise. I'm, I mean, I have eyes, I have a nose. I see all this delicious, decadent, hyper palatable vegan pizza and, and dessert. So it's not like I say, oh, I don't, I mean, I, so I wouldn't call it a craving. I'm like, wow, that looks good. But, you know, um, so I, I love my food so much. I really do. And I love the way I eat. And my fear is, is that if I eat that, I won't enjoy my food anymore. So it's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, I, I, as Doug Lyle would say, I run a cost benefit analysis. And I never told myself I couldn't have this stuff, by the way. Be I, I, I mean, I'm choosing not to have this stuff. It's not that I can't eat that. I mean, if somebody said, I'll give you a million dollars to eat a vegan cupcake, I'm, I'll be happy to do that. But I choose not to eat that. And to me, that's more empowering, more powerful to say that. And, you know, I can't promise I will never, ever eat that stuff. I mean, I don't know, but I, I feel so good. And my, you know, the thing about the sugar and the flour and all that stuff, it dysregulates your brain chemistry. And it, it, that's what causes the cravings is the eating of that stuff. And so as long as I abstain from the stuff that causes cravings, I don't have cravings. You know, I think at the beginning, you do because you there there's not only a psychological dependence on especially the sugar for people uh, i mean physio, there's a, both a physiological and a psychological dependence on it and so for some people if they're not willing to do some of the deeper work and look at you know as i say what is eating you rather than just what you're eating it's it's going to be harder and i think like you mentioned the the women know what to do, but they don't want to do it. I think a lot of times they're not looking at the other stuff. And so if you're using food to medicate, it's going to be hard to make this change unless you deal with what is going on in your life that's making you need some kind of drugs. And, and when I say drugs, these foods that people medicate with are more drug-like than food-like. So, you know, there's ways to um, obliterate cravings, annihilate them actually. And believe it or not, one of the ways is to eat vegetables, especially dark green leafies. In my Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we recommend vegetables for breakfast, not is the only thing you eat, but is the first thing you eat, particularly dark green leafies like Dr. Esselstyn recommends to his cardiac patients. And the reason is, is because people that are sugar addicted, they tend to start their day with something sweet, whether it's sweetened coffee or some kind of pastry or, or oatmeal and fruit, which is healthy, or fruit, which is healthy, but it's just too sweet. You want to start your day in a savory way. When you start it with vegetables, especially the dark green leafies, they actually contain a compound called thylakoids that have been proven to turn off the hunger switch to make you st stop having cravings, especially for sweet, and, and not overeat. And so that's one thing you can do is to squash cravings before they develop. The thing is, is people that have food addictions, which is refined food addictions, sugar, flour, and alcohol, are looking for that artificial stimulation from dopamine from these high fat, high calorie foods like sugar and flour and alcohol and often, you know, the very high fat plant foods. And so when they eat something like steamed kale at 100 calories a pound, even though it has these wonderful health benefits to their skin and to their bones and to their, and for so many reasons, and to fighting cravings, they don't get a lot of pleasure from it. And so it can take up to four months for people to neuroadapt and to downregulate that fat receptor and to get pleasure from these less stimulating foods. And so I think what happens is many people quit before the magic can happen. Right on. 
you know, you met, there's so many nuggets there. Um, the one thing that, that I, that stood out for me was, um, well, first of all, obviously the nutrient density and the, and the, um, you know, obviously, obviously the, um, the nutritional quality of the greens in the morning is, it, it makes, just makes so much sense, you know, when we think about dopamine and all of that. And then the other piece was the, the cravings. And, you know, for me, it was cheese many years ago. Uh, and I was truly a cheese addict. And when I gave that cheese up, um, I thought, how am I ever going to do it? And then today, of course, I can't even imagine, you know, I can't even imagine. And it's just what I call a non-negotiable. It's just something I do not have. And uh, it makes life so much easier. It's just not something I'm ever going to have. Yeah. I love that. And that's what I teach in my program because my program is an abstinence-based program, the concept of non-negotiable. And the thing about cravings is when you actually give into the craving, it doesn't make it go away. It intensifies the craving. And, you know, the first bite is the it, it, cravings wax and wane, just like hunger. When, when pe people at the True North Health Center fast for 40 days, slender people without food addictions for, for disease reversal, if they had to stay hungry 40 days, they wouldn't be able to do it. Hunger waxes and wanes. Cravings wax and wane. You can distract yourself from cravings. The worst thing you can do if you want to get rid of them is to, is to give into them because that actually intensifies them. So you can distract yourself. You can often find, you know, if you're craving sweet, instead of having a rich dessert, you can take a frozen banana in your champion juice or Vitamix or your Nana's machine and make a delicious banana saucer. So it's not that this way of eating is devoid of pleasure or sweetness or richness if you want. It's just that you just change the way you're doing it. You're not using the drug-like foods like the sugar, flour, and alcohol. Right, I love it. All right, Chef AJ. So here's, here's something that I, you know, I didn't know about your, uh, your background in comedy, which <laughs> I love hearing about. And, you know, it's a really interesting um, dichotomy because we have you as a, a comedian on one side and yet you as a, a struggling, you know, individual dealing with obesity, illness, um, maybe a, a poor relationship with your body and food and all of that. So tell us how these played out together and how comedy played a role. And maybe I, I'm, I'm going to just put this out there and maybe it saved you, maybe it helped you. Can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely, thank you for asking. So I was, you know, from the time that I can remember talking in school, I was always the class clown, much to the dismay of many of my teachers and principals because it was difficult for them because it was a straight A student, but behaviorally we used to get grades um, E, for excellent, S for satisfactory, U for unsatisfactory. So I would get A and a U. And that, that was kind of an interesting combination. Probably if they had ADHD medicine back then, they probably would have given it to me to shut me up. But my teachers thought I was hilarious. They encouraged me, like, you know, I was struggling in math because of my dyslexia and had to have a tutor. And they're like, just go into comedy. You're so funny. And the thing I think about comedy that helped me is that even though I was the fat kid, I was also the funny kid. And so I, I really, I don't remember getting bullied ever. Thank God. I know that's a, a really a, an issue today with so many kids for so many reasons. I, I got teased a little bit, but not, not, nothing that I couldn't handle because the thing is, is with comedy, you make fun of yourself first. And so then they, they can't hurt you. So I think a lot, I think a lot of it was a shield. There was a popular song, I believe it was in the 70s, called Tracks of My Tears by Linda Ronstadt. It went, people say I'm the life of the party because I tell a joke or two, but if you look down deep inside, you'll see that I am really blue. And that was me, crying on the inside, but laughing on the outside. And that, it's, it's, a, it's a protection mechanism, but, but I actually also did enjoy it because there, you know, I don't know if it's dopamine that gets released, but when I was on the cruise, I was really able to, to be funnier than I am in many of my presentations because it's just it's a little bit different kind of way of presenting and there's something like a rush that when you say something funny and they laugh it's just it's almost like addictive I guess in a way so I enjoyed it I never got tremendous success in LA I, I mean I was on the Tonight Show David Letterman Jay Leno but the truth is is up until last August when I went back to the improv to do my last set before moving out of LA it's been about 10 years since I, I've done it but I do try to incorporate it in my teaching you know when I do live presentations because I feel that it, people pay more attention and, and, and then they learn what I'm trying to teach better. You know, teaching calorie density, it's not exactly a hilarious topic, right? But I do try to incorporate humor, just mainly so people will stay awake, you know? <laughs> right, right. 
Right. And I think people who are struggling really need some of that because I think that when, when you're struggling, like I know it was for me, um, I kind of lost my funny bone. You know, I kind of lost that uh, freedom and just sort of peace and, and I guess lightheartedness yeah. because it's a heavy topic. If you're, if you're really struggling, it's, it's not fun. So to have that and to be teaching with that, I think is a really valuable thing. Yeah. To, so that's great. Yeah. I think that's why Dr. Michael Greger is one of the most popular plant-based presenters because he is so funny. Right. Yeah. He's great. I love him. Dr. AJ, we are coming toward the end of our time together. And uh, so first of all, thank you so much for all of this wonderful information. And I know that you have a little something for our audience. I'm wondering yeah, so I put together my favorite Instant Pot recipes. And if you sign up for my website, which is my name, Chef AJ website, or it's eatunprocessed.com, we'll send them to you. And I think there's a bonus recipe for a, a granola that I really like that I make a lot for my husband. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been great having you and um, all the best. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you.